Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Podcast Spotlight Hour on Bloomberg Radio. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine. Plus, global business, finance, and tech news. The Bloomberg Business Week podcast with Carol Messer and Tim Stenebeck from Bloomberg Radio. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the weekend edition of Bloomberg Business Week. Well, we got another round of closely watched U.S. economic reports this week on inflation, retail sales, and consumer sentiment, to name a few. Bottom line, Tim, the data really continuing to come in mixed, also showing persisting inflation and a miss on retail sales. So with that as our backdrop, Julie Van Ullen, Chief Revenue Officer over at Rakuten, stopped by with some thoughts on the U.S. consumer. Plus, Boeing in the news again this week as many questions remain, and it continues to face a fallout over a January accident in which the panel covering on an unused door on a Boeing 737 MAX 9 blew open during a flight. Those Boeing struggles giving Airbus a chance at aviation dominance. Yeah, the headlines, right? Just continuing to cross. Yeah. All right, the chip war also on, as you know, as tensions escalate between the U.S. and China. Chris Miller, New York Times bestselling author of Chip War, the fight for the world's most critical technology, will be with us later this hour. All of that to come. We begin with a quick check on the U.S. consumer, courtesy of the free app and a browser that provides coupons and discounts where shoppers earn cash back on purchases. More with Julie Van Ullen, Chief Revenue Officer sir at Rakuten, who we caught up with just before this week's weaker than expected retail sales report. I mean, the trend continues where we got to wake up every day and see what's going on. Uh, it is still our moment is still that of pivoting and, and understanding what is the consumer doing today. And what I can say is that inflation continues to increase, as we all know, uh, particularly in areas that impact the consumer, gas, energy, rent prices. And that really highlights a potentially negative impact on retailers as these consumers effectively look to save money. Now, saving money can come in all sorts of different forms. As we know, Rakuten offers a really valuable um, offering to our retailers and brands by way of giving value to consumers uh, as, as cash back, right? So we're very well positioned for a moment like this that we're calling, you know, cautiously out shopping last year is what we're seeing on our platform, largely driven by the fact that consumers do still seem to be interested in spending and from what we see actually out spending last year, Hmm. but very much uh, associated with categories and brands who are offering them the value that they're looking for. What are some of those categories? What are some of those brands? If you can dig a little deeper into the data here. So the categories who have really leaned in heavily, understanding that the the consumer of today is looking for value and who have increased cash back rates over last year, we see the pets category doing extremely well, having grown over 100% in trips year over year. We also see appliances and hardware. Um, They're seeing an increase of 12% in average order value. Um, marketplaces also doing extremely well, uh, home and garden, and travel is a real standout because typically Q1 is a very promotional period for travel, and they spend quite a lot to to lure consumers their way in Q1 anyway. And this, this Q1 has kind of not been uh, too different, except there's even more leaning into those higher cash back rates to achieve... Um, the high price point purchases that they're looking for. And travel has increased 22% year over year for us in terms of trips. So when you say they're leaning in more to get that spend, I guess, in their basket to get the cash back. So does that mean the retailer who is ever offering up the deal is in the driver's seat or is the consumer in the driver's seat because they're pushing for a better and better deal because they kind of need to? Well, it's a great question and it's two sides of the same coin. You know, I I think the consumers are, if you look at this data, they're very clearly saying, I have the money and I will buy from retailers and brands who are willing to deliver me value. And I think the, the categories and brands who are doing well, like the data we just reviewed, are the ones who are listening to that message and are reacting by offering higher cash back rates because it really is within their their power, the, the brand and the retailer's power to use Rakuten to offer more cash back to their shoppers. 
What typically precedes a, a slowdown in consumer spending? Like, what are the signals that you could be looking for right now in the data that you have that would say, okay, well, the economy is indeed slowing down? Uh, I would say, which is something that we're not seeing today, is that if you are in a challenged economic moment where inflation continues and you have a brand like Rakuten, who has an offering that allows retailers to provide the value to the shoppers that they're looking for and that isn't working, that would probably be a sign that consumers really are pulling back. But we see the exact opposite, that versus last year, brands are investing and shoppers are responding and outspending. Julie Van Allen, Chief Revenue Officer at Rakuten. All right, now to a week that was also chock full of news on Boeing. The full rundown, of course, can be found at Bloomberg.com. Of note, though, the U.S. Federal Trade Commission Chair Lena Kahn saying in a speech that Boeing became too big to fail after it bought up domestic competitors and became the country's largest commercial aerospace maker. Meantime, Bloomberg News reported the Justice Department this week convened a grand jury as part of a criminal investigation into that midair blowout. The controversy has become an opportunity for the company's lone major competitor, Airbus. And this is the topic of a story in the current issue of Bloomberg Business Week. Business Week Assistant Managing Editor Jim Ellis joins us with more. To change aircraft makers is a big deal for big an deal. airline. But we've gotten to a moment now where there's so much bad news. There's a lot of questioning about the quality of uh, Boeing's equipment right now that it comes at a particularly bad time for Boeing simply because a lot of people are starting to think, a lot of airlines are starting to think about the next generation of aircraft. And, um, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, things are happening now. Everybody's going to jump and run to Boeing. It's very, uh, excuse me, run away from Boeing. It's very difficult to do simply because, you know, as you said, your, your, your crews are trained on that. And you've made these multi-billion dollar investments. But what's at stake here is the next generation of planes. What happens is that because in the airline business, you can use a piece of, of aircraft for decades, you don't make these decisions to change lightly. So instead, it's time to think about the next generation. And so what Airbus is doing now is they're going to have some some room to go ahead and say, I'm going to come up with a new plane at a time when Boeing is so, you know, sort of troubled and so con consumed with thinking about how can it deal with its um, uh, quality problems? How can it also deal with its balance sheet problems? I mean, Boeing is in the point right now where it doesn't have a lot of financial flexibility to build a new plane. And so Airbus, however, is probably about a $50 billion advantage over it mm -hmm. from a debt standpoint. And so they can move ahead and start planning for the next generation and sort of seal this dominance that they're probably going to have of the aircraft business. Jim, tell us how fortunes can change. And I love how the story starts and you guys go back to 1987, if we can all remember back then. It's a while It's a away. while. But, t but talk about what happened and how that maybe set the stage for where Airbus is today. Yeah, I mean, what happened is it, it, a lot of people thought when Airbus decided to bring out its A320, narrow body airline, uh, airliner, the people thought, oh, well, we're going to do that. I mean, we've got the 737. The 737 was rules the skies, and um, they come out with this A320. They have a great party. They have, you know, sort of Prince Charles at that time, Lady Diana. I mean, it's big, big deal. Fireworks and everything, and everybody says, that's not going anywhere. You, know, you cannot beat them. They And at that time, Boeing had 10 times as many uh, 737s popping out than A320s. Fast forward to today, and the A320 has become the best-selling commercial aircraft of all time. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's a big deal, given that um, Boeing had commanded that market for so long, and the 737 has been a major player in aircraft for almost a half century. How much of that is the mistakes and problems that Boeing has had? How much of it is it just folks started to kind of really like the A320 and uh, uh, shift uh, their ordering book? A lot of it is that the A320 just sort of came in with a lot of innovations that, you know, customers connected with. What they call fly-by-wire, that sort of joystick, uh, sort of all electronic cockpit. The idea that it was a slightly larger plane, mm -hmm. which then set off this whole thing of continually making these planes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. I measure how big my seat is. I don't know about you guys, that, but I you do. Know, it, it turned out that they were in the right place at the right time, mm -hmm. but they were also extremely, um, you know, because they didn't have an older model that they were basically just retrofitting, they could think differently. 
They sort of took it and they ran with it, and now they're in a position to think about the next generation of airplanes that can you know, fly on sustainable fuel, that can um, uh, do all sorts of uh, you know sort of electronic things in the cockpit, but also can take structures of airliners in a different way. They're planning a plane now for this next generation that has a wing that's shaped like a bird's wing that can actually change its shape and flight. And also because airports weren't built for these new giant planes that we're building now, yeah. they're gonna have um, um, aircraft with the wing tips that fold up. So you can still put it in the same place, but it, you know, and then when you pull it away from the, uh, onto the tarmac, flip the wings out. It's, I mean, they are basically taking uh, advantage of what they have right now, which is a lot of money, right. as well as not the look of, of, of all the stock market saying, oh my God, you're a terrible company, you know, which is what Boeing has to deal with right now. Well, just like in the late 1980s when Airbus was the upstart against Boeing, now there's another upstart out there that should have what for practical purposes is a duopoly between Airbus and Boeing, right. but may not be forever. Enter what China has. Comac, China's aircraft company, which a lot of people in the West don't know because it has only so far built planes for Chinese carriers. But the thing that remember is that Chinese carriers have become major purchasers of Western aircraft. Most of the aircraft you know, flown by the big three Chinese airlines are you know, Boeing or Airbus. And however, a big percentage of the order books for these American and European companies come from Chinese airlines. Now China has decided it wants to be a player in the aircraft business. It feels like, why are they giving all this money to the West? They want to take that duopoly and make it into a triopoly. And um, that has got to be a frightening thing Can for Boeing especially. Can they pull that off outside of China in that would regulators in the U.S. and Europe well, well, foreseeably approve these that, that, airliners? That's the question. And, and part of that is you know, a safety issue. Part of that is just engineering issue. And part of that is a political issue. Um, you know, in the sense that, you know, can China build an aircraft that flies? I mean, they're doing it now. I mean, they're um, doing it for Chinese airlines. And they finally have uh, gotten a non-Chinese airline, though it's Tibet Air. You know, that, that's, uh, but then they are also marketing it now to Western aircraft. And, and they will find some sales there. But the issue becomes one of whether they want to take more of their own carers and sort of persuade them to buy Chinese. And if they do that, that takes away a lot of the sort of extra stuff in the um, order books of the Western uh, aircraft makers. Our thanks to Bloomberg Businessweek Assistant Managing Editor Jim Ellis. You can read this story and more out on newsstands now on the Bloomberg Terminal or at Bloomberg.com slash Businessweek. Coming up, how global companies are fighting for the world's most critical technology. Navigating the chip wars with Chris Miller, author of a book by the same name. You're listening to Bloomberg Businessweek. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. Listen on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. All right, news this past week. The Pentagon pulling out of a plan to spend as much as $2.5 billion on a chip grant to Intel. This is Chinese Premier Li Qiang made the rounds of China's top AI and chip equipment firms over in China, calling for accelerating investments in those areas. The back and forth continued. We should point out Intel still gets money from the government under the Chips Act, but things are changing a little bit. Oh, yeah, they certainly are. And then last week, the U.S. government pressed allies to further tighten restrictions on China's access to semiconductor technology. Always a lot going on in the semiconductor space. You can count on that. And so we recently caught up again with Chris Miller, Associate Professor of International History at Tufts University. Timmy, always remind us, Chris was way ahead of the curve when it comes to the global battle in the chip space. He is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Chip War, The Fight for the World's Most Critical Technology. The book came out in 2022. We began our conversation with Chris, like most do these days, on the growth of artificial intelligence and why chips semiconductors serve such a critical role. AI has really transformed the chip industry. It's the key demand driver going forward. And the big question hanging over AI is, when will we start to see large scale monetization? How soon will that happen? And at what scale? Because ultimately, the reason why all the hyperscalers are investing tens of billions of dollars in building up AI infrastructure and in buying lots of NVIDIA GPUs is because they believe there's money that will be made at the end of this process. And that's why 
questions like, well, how much does Microsoft make off Copilot or what does uh, OpenAI's revenue look like? These are the key indicators that investors are looking at to assess what will be the implication of AI for corporate profits. Well, Chris, how do you distinguish between the names in the space? You've got the once giants or leaders. I'm thinking of Intel, Texas Instruments, the new leaders, NVIDIA, AMD has come so far. The company that seems to stand alone, TSMC, um, the semiconductor companies, the equipment makers. Like, How do you distinguish? How should the Bloomberg audience be thinking about a space that's got a lot of different names in them? Well, the good news is that as AI advances, you actually need more types of chips in larger quantities to take advantage. It's not just the AI processors that you need that NVIDIA produces, it's also more memory, especially the high bandwidth memory produced by companies like SK Hynix or Samsung. And you also end up needing more mixed signal and analog chips because these are the chips that collect the data that's then being processed by uh, AI systems and semi-autonomous cars, for example. So that's why the uh, boom in AI has benefited most companies in the industry, even if they're not directly producing the GPUs that are at the center of AI. And it's also why it's not just the chip designers themselves, it's also the tool makers from ASML to applied materials that are benefiting as chip making companies by even more tools. But ultimately all of these do depend on their end customers continuing to invest in more and more semiconductors. And that's where the capital expenditure decisions of the big tech firms, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and others will be key to sustaining this level of investment going forward. Chris, I want to go back to monetization, and I'm so glad you brought it up because it's something that, that we talk about a lot. We understand the beneficiaries on the chip side of AI, but at the same time, we do see company stocks near all-time highs for companies investing in this type of technology, including Meta Platforms, Microsoft, on the private side, OpenAI, and others. Um, what are the indications to you that we are seeing monetization at this point? And, and when, in your opinion, do you think we're going to start seeing real efficiencies as the result of AI? Well, I think the good news is that if you look across a much broader cross section of companies, take the Fortune 500 in aggregate, most companies on that list are at least exploring ways that they can use AI either to refine their products or to drive down costs. And so the key is not going to be, I don't think, any individual company or even any individual sector. It's going to be, can many different sectors learn to apply AI for many different use cases? And that makes it harder to measure, but it also makes AI probably more sustainable in the long run, if it's not one or two killer applications, but rather lots of uses that end up being uh, accretive either to a company's profits or to driving down uh, their costs. But for investors looking at the space, trying to understand how real is this and how sustainable is the investment, it means you've got to look at a much broader cross section of companies to ascertain uh, where is AI actually gaining traction. And how do you roll into something like, you know, Apple's making chips, Microsoft, uh, Alphabet, Google, right? Like, it's just kind of getting crowded, you know, more crowded, if you will. I mean, how do you roll those guys into the already established players? Do you see them in the near future or in the longer term as being really pretty form formidable in this industry? Well, I think they are in some ways already competitors to companies like um, AMD or NVIDIA uh, and companies that are big enough to have scale in the data center business, like those that you mentioned have a strong incentive to design their own chips, both because they can hone their design so that they specifically match the workloads that those companies are running in the data centers, but also because the more choice they have, both in-house design chips and externally designed chips, the more pricing power they hope they can win vis-a-vis -vis their biggest suppliers, companies like NVIDIA, for example. And so there's a market rationale as well as the technical rationale for companies to design their own in-house ships. And what we've seen, as you said, is a trend where almost every big tech company is now uh, designing not just often one chip for themselves, but multiple different types of chips for their own data center efforts. We want to move on to the, the, the actual chip war, which is what your book was all about, because we feel like it just is picking up tensions. But before we do, which among the semiconductor companies that are out there do you find most interesting and that you think we must, I think about the investing audience of, of Bloomberg, must always keep on your radar? You know, a lot of people who are are, are only uh, paying attention to this space and alongside the rest of the tech sector don't often focus enough on the tool makers, the companies that make the tools that make the chips possible. But if you look at 
the uh, extraordinary growth in uh, the industry over the past several years. It's not just the chip designers like NVIDIA or AMD. It's also the companies that produce the tools, ASML mm -hmm. or LAM Research or Applied Materials, uh, that, are, uh, that are benefiting just as much from uh, a lot of the growth in this industry. The U.S.-China battle for tech supremacy. Chips are certainly at the top of the list. AMD hitting a roadblock because of U.S. rules. Um, take a step back and, and, and just give us your impression about why the U.S. is now pressing allies to make sure that China doesn't get its hands on certain types of chips. Like, big picture, what's worst case scenario here? Like, why does the U.S. and its allies want to keep China from getting this technology? The U.S. strategy, I, I think, is pretty straightforward. And the dilemma the U.S. faces is this. By any metric, China will quantitatively outproduce the U.S. in terms of military systems, whether it's ships or missiles or drones. China already has more, and it will have even more of a quantitative edge in the future. And so the U.S. is hoping it can retain its qualitative edge in terms of defense and intelligence systems by applying advanced computing and AI to defense. And doing so requires having better advanced computing and better AI than China. And that's at the core of what the U.S. is trying to accomplish here. It's laser focused on AI chips and the machines that are capable of making cutting edge AI chips with the aim of restraining the growth of China's AI ecosystem and keeping a technological edge that the United States has had for the past several decades. With that in mind, and I keep thinking about TSMC, you know, the ultimate fabricator. I mean, people can design chips, but ultimately they go to TSMC to make them and spit them out. How critical is it for the United States or other countries, you know, to back off of their dependency on TSMC? Well, I think you see a lot of interest in the U.S. and Europe and Japan and elsewhere to have a more diversified manufacturing footprint, which is partly why TSMC is building new plants in the U.S., mm -hmm. in Japan, and in Germany. But the reality is that when it comes to AI processors in particular, like the GPUs that NVIDIA makes, almost all of them are manufactured by TSMC in Taiwan. Right. So thus far, we haven't actually seen uh, much diversification, at least when it comes to these ultra cutting edge chips. So how critical is it then for the US to reduce that dependency? Well, I think you see that the United States spending a fair amount of money trying. Uh, the CHIPS yeah, Act right. uh, is going to spend $40 billion uh, precisely on incentivizing firms to build factories in the United States and Japan and Europe are doing the same thing. Does it go far enough here in the U.S. because we have seen some prominent players pull back on and scale back on some of these plans in the U.S.? Well, I think uh, it's it's never going to be easy to see supply chains shift in a big way over a short period of time. The the chip supply chain and the role of TSMC was built up over uh, many decades, and so you're it's just implausible to imagine the shift is going to happen uh, quickly. And it's not going to happen quickly, both because it's hard and slow, but also because the reason TSMC has uh, such an entrenched position is because its economies of scale uh, have given it a technological edge. And so it's not just about any individual type of technology or subsidies for any individual factory. It's the entire business model that gives uh, TSMC its position. And that's why TSMC is going to be very hard for any of its competitors to dislodge at the top of the foundry market and why I really think most of the industry is expecting TSMC to remain the dominant player for a very long time to come. Is it realistic to think that if the U.S. is successful in cutting off this technology to China, that China will not develop this on its own? I mean, after all, last August, we got the news that in this Huawei phone, there was a chip developed uh, that was more than a generation ahead of where the U.S. had sought to halt China's progress. Well, I think China is no doubt going to try to keep developing uh, its uh, both semiconductor and its AI capabilities. And there are uh, a very large number of uh, very well-trained and intelligent people in the country who are going to be focused on uh, this effort. I, I think the question is really what the technological gap between, for example, the chips that can be made in Taiwan and the chips that can be made in China. And, and what you find if you look closely is that for certain types of chips, that gap has closed somewhat. But there still is a at least four year gap, maybe a five year gap between the cutting edge Taiwanese capabilities and the uh, most advanced capabilities today in China. And we'll see if China can close that further. Uh, but the U.S. is trying to prevent that both by incentivizing its companies uh, to race forward technologically via the CHIPS Act and other R&D funds, but also by making it harder and harder for China to access cutting edge chip making tools. Chris, forgive me if I sound naive. I mean, the stakes, I understand as you lay it out, very high. We know we've been reporting all the stories for countries, for companies, right? This tech battle for supremacy. Why does it have to be a fight? Why is it a fight? 
Well, like the first ships that were invented were uh, emerged essentially for use in guiding nuclear missiles more accurately. And since then, mm -hmm. militaries and intelligence agencies have seen computing as core to their ability to produce next generation systems. And at a time when you see every major defense ministry, whether it's in Beijing or in Washington or Tokyo, anywhere on the world, they're all right now trying to deploy AI to military systems to make them more capable, uh, more efficient, more accurate. And this means that AI is not only going to be powering systems like ChatGPT, it's also going to be used in military and intelligence use cases as well. And that mm -hmm. is a sphere where there's a really severe competition right now between uh, China and the United States. You're also a consultant for uh, several different firms um, or in several different capacities, I should know. What's the number one question you get uh, from executives at the companies you work with? The key question companies are asking is both what's next in Beijing and also what's next in Washington in terms of the types of regulation that we're going to see either from Congress or from the next presidential administration. That was Chris Miller, Associate Professor of International History at Tufts University. His book, Chip War, The Fight for the World's Most Critical Technology. All right, speaking of battles, up next, what one individual says is our biggest fight, a former owner of the L.A. Dodgers and longtime businessman Frank McCourt Jr. on reclaiming liberty, humanity, and dignity in the digital age. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Listen live each weekday starting at 2 p.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Carol, I've been doing this thought experiment lately. It's a mm -hmm. very informal poll. It's anecdotal. So what I do is I ask parents who have teenagers, neighbors, colleagues about a proposed TikTok ban. And I've heard the same thing from all of them. I hope this thing goes through. My kid spends way too much time on TikTok. That's amazing. So they're definitely in favor of a ban. Well, Tim, the option could be on the table after the U.S. House of Representatives passed a bill this past week to ban TikTok in the U.S. unless its Chinese owner sells the video sharing app. In response, China called on the U.S. to stop unreasonably suppressing TikTok. It's not just TikTok that has its critics. People have a fraught relationship with all different types of technology. Think about it. Hardware, software, apps, you name it. So how did we get here? Well, thinking a lot about this and on a solution to technology's grip on everything we do and the data it controls is Frank McCourt Jr., chairman of McCourt Global, a company with interest in real estate, sports, technology, media, and more. Frank also the founder and executive chairman of Project Liberty, which in its own words is advancing the responsible development of the Internet of Tomorrow designed and governed for the common good. Frank McCourt Jr., also the author of the new book, Our Biggest Fight, Reclaiming Liberty, Humanity, and Dignity in the Digital Age. We began by asking how this former owner and chairman of the L.A. Dodgers, owner of a French football club who worked in construction, real estate, technology, went on to spend so much money and time fighting the Internet as we know it. So I wrote Our Biggest Fight to really shine light on Project Liberty, which is a, a $500 million initiative to reimagine how the Internet works and, you know, and, and really take back control of our data, uh, which I would say is really our personhood mm. in this digital era from the kind of the machines of big tech, right? Who, who are the machines? We are connected to the Internet by an IP address. Mm -hmm. So let's start right there. Okay, the internet is not you and I connected, it's our device connected. It was built to connect devices, machines, and that's how the internet came into being. And then 35 years ago, Tim Berners-Lee created the World Wide Web. That was to connect data. We have never been connected as people on the internet. So what I put forward in the book is now knowing how powerful the internet is and how dependent we are on it and how everything we do virtually is digitized. We need an internet where we're in charge or we're owning and controlling, so to speak, our data and we reclaim that personhood. Well, safe to say we didn't know we were giving it up, right? We just thought, wow, this is a really cool thing and look at all the things we can do. And many would argue right at the same time that the internet and that connectivity has allowed us to do so much more and learn so much more about the other but then there's the dark side and bad side to it. Can we kind of regain our digital identity? Yeah. Can we, we go back? Yeah, we must. We can, 
and we must. And I, I do want to focus on something first before I get to that solution and, and so forth. And I, I do think we are learning more and more about the harms, right? We hear them every day. And, and, and this, we and talk the, about it all the time. And it's just going to get worse as a generative AI enters the picture. Because a broken technology made more powerful will just make the problems worse. But I want to just just highlight one thing. You said, you know, there are a lot of good things and then some bad things. I hear that a lot, that we, we kind of somehow think of this technology um, differently than we would think of, for instance, let's say we were sitting here and some municipality had a, a water system, They're putting water in a, a million homes. And you were reporting that 400,000 of those homes were getting toxic water mm -hmm. that, were, that were making uh, the household sick and killing some kids. Okay, would we sit here and say, well, yeah, but it's, it's putting clean water in 600,000 homes, so kind of on balance. It, why are we so tolerant of, of, of the harms of technology? Look, the internet is ours. It's our data. We should be in charge. Why would we want machines to drag us into a future we don't want? Let's just take a minute, yeah. fix it and then make it more powerful. And we fix it by putting individuals in control. I'm happy to talk about so, the fix. So, so in this case, in this analogy, what's the toxic water? What are the harms being okay. done? So yeah, so where to begin, right? So let's think about this. Uh, let's think about it this way. Okay, I'm the head of the postal service. And I come to you and say, I have an idea. I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna deliver your mail. No stamps for free. So no more stamps. So you say, okay, I'm going to listen. We, we, maybe I'd be a little bit suspicious, right? but I'd listen. Then I'd say, uh, okay, here's the deal. I'm going to put cameras in every one of your homes, mm -hmm. every one of the rooms in your house, mm -hmm. in your car, in your workplace, and so forth. And I'm just going to surveil you 24-7. You'd kind of be creeped out by that, right? And then i say, well, yeah, but it's free. And then I'd say, one more thing. I'm going to open your mail. I'm going to read it. And everything I learn is now mine. Okay, your relationships, your ideas, everything else. And then you say, well, that's, I would never, why would I do that? Not okay. And, yeah, not okay. And then I say, well. But we do it. Wait, one, one, well, one other thing. I'm going to read your 13-year-old daughter's diary. And I'm going and, and to learn she's a little concerned about her weight. She's 13. She's insecure, a little vulnerable. I, I've got some stuff I want to sell her. And I'm going to profit from her insecurities. It's sick. It's not something we should be putting up with. And so my point is that we have a decentralized internet, something that Tim Berners-Lee wrote a letter. He said, I created something that was decentralized, that was intended to empower human beings, you know, the proverbial tide that lifts all yeah. boats, and it became something very centralized. Well, and these big apps are scraping our data, and they're applying algorithms, and they're doing things with it that are not good for society. Brink, you're obviously so passionate about this, and I, I've gotta ask, do you have any sort of dog in the fight here? Like, is there, do you have any sort of financial interest in creating a more open internet? I hope that our tech people will eventually build things in this new world, like with millions of other people. But our focus right now has been to, to put forward a piece of infrastructure, public digital infrastructure. We'll call it a protocol level piece called DSNP, which we've gifted to the world. It's basically like Tim Berners-Lee gifted HTTP. No one should own the internet or own our relationships. That's the point we're trying to make here. And then we can all build on it. I would also add that we need to be creating a commercial ecosystem here that people will build on or all this just is a nice idea that will never happen because these are huge, huge platforms. So I think, you know, we're sitting back and, and I'm, I'm, I'm seeing and, and, and feeling the same things that you all are about something's wrong. Mm -hmm. We're seeing the harms to kids. We're seeing our information ecosystem is completely contaminated. We're seeing democracy struggle. So we need to fix this. And so normally you'd go to these big tech CEOs and say, the problems are obvious. We've had hearings after hearing and this, fix it. They haven't. And they're not incentivized to fix it. In the, in the pre-digital world, then you'd go to your elected officials. You know, you'd go to Congress and say, look at the harms. You need to regulate this or have some new policies. We've seen now for several years, it's theater, right? People show up, there's these big hearings and Zuckerberg and the rest show up and then nothing happens. Be why? 
our politics is impacted by this very same technology that oh. just polarizes everybody and causes that paralysis. Well, that's it, what it I, feels like that. I mean, it feels like every opportunity for a lawmaker to do something outrageous is an opportunity to them for, to create a click and raise money. I well, mean, that's the whole thing that's going on with TikTok. I keep asking the question, is it politics or policy that people are concerned about? And it just just feels like people are more concerned about politically what they can say and how it looks. TikTok, ban? Should we ban it? Well, well TikTok for sure is a problem for two reasons. One is, again, this surveillance aspect of it where it's collecting all of our uh, our information and in TikTok's case exporting it the Chinese Communist Party has all this information on all of us American citizens of course that shouldn't happen but the other point I want to make is the model of this extractive exploitive predatory technology where we're we're being essentially surveilled and our information is being scraped is the same model that American apps are using. Such so, as? Such as Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and Google and Amazon and so forth. It's all about our social graph, which is essentially all of our our personal data. And that doesn't just mean where we shop or buy shoes. Yeah. It's everything Mark about Zuckerberg us. has talked about this for years. The, he's used that term publicly, the social graph. I mean, he tried to get it sort of a, an iteration of it to take off in the Facebook news feed, my gosh, back in like 2012. But how do you get away from it, even in the platform that you are offering up? Because in a digital world, doesn't something live somewhere always? So, yeah, that's a great, a great question. Now, first of all, I'm not offering up a platform. <clears throat> I'm offering up a roadmap. And the title of the book is not My Biggest Fight. It's our biggest fight. This is not going to happen unless we bring really millions of people into this conversation. And so what we're suggesting is we have a problem with the infrastructure. Look, I'm a fifth generation builder. We build infrastructure. Mm -hmm. We have an infrastructure or engineering problem that we can fix and then build great stuff on it. But if we don't fix the tech, we're going to continually be spending all of our time and precious tax money and resources and so forth on putting out these fires and mitigating damage. Why not just fix the problem and then go start solving the other problems that the Americans want to see, see solved? So we need now not just to have a tech project, and Project Liberty is also a project that brings in civil society and brings in social scientists so that the next generation of the internet is not just designed by technologists. Do you think this problem can be solved with, with the free market alone or the government needs to get involved? Another great question. I think we can definitely solve the tech problem with the free market alone, and we can build out the new, let's call it the improved internet. I mean, that's a David and Goliath story, because you're talking about a startup essentially going against the biggest companies in the world. I like our chances if it's millions of people getting involved here. Right. Yeah, I, I don't like our chances if it's a little, if it's a, a David against a Goliath story, I don't like our chances. If it's a million Davids, against the Goliath, we will change this. And so I, I think this all can be changed. Eventually, once people see that there's an alternative to this, it doesn't have to be this way, then I think the government will step in because they'll have to, to, to make sure they facilitate that. Tell us what you would like to leave our audience with. Socialize this issue. Talk about this issue. I know there are millions of people out there seeing and feeling the same thing I am and you are. And so let's get it to the kitchen table. Let's get it to the sideline of the soccer game, the kids' soccer game. Let's get it to the school board and to the, and to the parents in schools. Let's talk about it after church. Let's socialize this issue because I think we're going to find that millions and millions of people, once they realize how their data is being used and how it's being turned to hurt them, and harm them and harm their kids, they're going to be outraged. Our thanks to Frank McCourt Jr., chairman of McCourt Global, founder and executive chairman of Project Liberty. His new book, Our Biggest Fight, Reclaiming Liberty, Humanity, and Dignity in the Digital Age. Catch the full conversation on our podcast feed at Bloomberg.com. And that wraps up our first hour of the weekend edition of Bloomberg Business Week from Bloomberg Radio. Ahead in our next hour, we talk luxury from fine wines to mighty fine and expensive South Florida real estate. Plus, speaking of fine, uh, flying privately, courtesy of the president and CEO of Sentient Jet, how it's going and what he makes of some of the blowback against some celebs and others flying private jets quite a bit. Mm. You know, Taylor Swift gets a lot of flack for this. Yeah, but she's not alone. She's not alone. All this, right. This is Bloomberg Business Week. I'm Tim Stenevec. And I'm Carol Masser. Stay with us, everyone. Today's top stories and global business headlines coming up right now.
You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Listen live each weekday starting at 2 p.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Plenty ahead in our second hour of the weekend edition of Bloomberg Business Week, including buying into Florida's luxury real estate market, what's hot and who's buying and how much they're spending. Yeah, and also if you want to uh, get to that pricey Florida real estate, Carol, <laughs> you're going to need to jump on a plane, perhaps if you're not there, maybe even a private jet. We're going to talk private aviation with the president and CEO of Sentient Jet, Andrew Collins. We'll hear from him in just a moment. Plus, fun for me, fun for both of us as we went deep into the world of wine with Wine and Spirits magazine editor-in-chief Josh Green. And guess what, everyone? Younger generation. Drinking wine? Not so much. Yeah, first up this hour, the use of private jets skyrocketed during the COVID pandemic as wealthy people look to limit exposure to public spaces and airlines curtailed services on many routes. Demand, however, slowed in 2023 as economic uncertainty sparked concern and carriers began restoring schedules back to pre-pandemic levels. All right. So for checking how the industry is faring, the outlook for the year, we checked in again with Andrew Collins, president and CEO of Sentient Jet and co-CEO of the parent company, FlexJet. He got right to it by talking about demand. If you look at it from a fractional ownership standpoint, there was a lot of selling that happened and a lot of pent up hours that happened. So we just had the most flying we've ever had in company history over President Day weekend, right? Um, if you look at it from a jet card standpoint, which is sentient jet, we did see it kind of start to soften. And in the on-demand market, it's really getting back to kind of a, it's still growth over 2019 and you're still seeing some of the people retained from the pandemic, but it isn't like 21 and 22 where I think everybody was running around with their hair on fire. To that demand over President's Day holiday, were there deals? Like, I don't know how you guys no, do it in the industry. It, so, what was it all about? No, it's it's you know, I'll tell you what. In 21 and 22, um, it was long hours, long days, and every day felt like what we call a peak day. It just felt like everybody wanted to fly persistently. It used to be that like a Monday or a Tuesday, or you know, you get a break. There was not a lot of breaks. Now, what's happening is you're having high concentration days, and so in the fractional world, where somebody buys for a five-year time horizon mm -hmm. into an aircraft, they buy the hours they're going to use that so the owner demand for that spikes on certain days and so collectively we've we've got the most hours under management we've ever had as a company and it, it unlocked on president's day how weekend. much is an in inventory those hours like i'm always curious like do you guys look at that of like okay this is stuff that people have paid for have to spend and use yeah, no, we, it's actually one of the major KPIs in our business. It's called hours under management. And you have to look at it by product, by aircraft, and you have to think about it. And that's how you do your demand, your demand shaping, how you think about capacity planning and everything else. For how sure. much visibility does it give you right now? Um, it gives me very good visibility. Like the forward looks really good. 12 months? It's still good. 24 months? Um, depends on how our year goes from a selling standpoint. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Pilots, having trouble getting pilots? No, um, I think the, the challenge for us, so we, we probably hired 400 pilots at the FlexJet level in 23. We'll do the same this year. Um, I think what you have to think about is, number one, we actually try to hire the best of the best pilots. We don't look for just any pilot, right? So where are they coming from? Are they coming from regional carriers or are they retiring from? No, they could be coming from a competitor. They okay. could be coming from a regional carrier. Okay. They could be coming out of the military. Okay, um, but what we found is you want to make sure that if you're hiring somebody, you're hiring on a track where they're going to stay through three years. They stay through three years, they're in for a career. We want it to be a career mm -hmm. destination. We do find that, <clears throat> excuse me, we're actually competing more with commercial airlines than we are any other competitor because the commercial airlines are really putting out large sums of money and large cash. And you they're know, unionized. And, and, and they're unionized. But what people forget is the history of commercial, right? Where there's furloughs and things happen. And so, you know, yeah. and so, so it looks very rosy right now. Um, I think we've got a pretty methodical plan and a pretty good destination for you as a career type. So yeah, we've, we've put a lot of money into uh, uh, recruiting our pilots. Who's an ideal pilot in terms of age and hours that they've already got? So you want somebody that's got the time and type. You want somebody that's experienced. You want somebody that has at least a minimum of 3,000 hours. You know, he really has like, uh, we actually increased it recently as oh, opposed to decrease it. Most yeah. people are decreasing it. it. That's We're why I wanted to it. ask you. 100%. Yeah. And that's actually a good bellwether for us. That just shows you the strength of who we are. We're trying not to fall into the trap of, you know, recruit at all costs. We're trying to get the best of the best. Can you remind us on pricing? 
Like sure. Give us an idea of like if somebody wants to take a trip and have you upped sure. it in the last if 12 months. you have months. to ask, you can't afford it. <laughs> so like my mother. <laughs> so I, I, let me speak to it at the card level because that's, that's where I had a lot of experience. Um, at the end of the day, during the surge, um, when everybody wanted it, we the market would bear anything, right? Yeah. And for us, we had to keep up with the market and keep pace and make sure we were living up to the consumer promise. So we had to augment pricing. Okay. So we augmented pricing probably by 35%. It's the biggest jump I've ever seen. And we've kept it there. And wow. the market is bearing it. It's it's our sell through is probably about ten to fifteen percent less than what we were doing, but we're very happy with the clients we bring in. Got it. Yeah. Uh, hey, I want to talk sustainability a little bit because sustainable is not something you think of when you think about private air travel. And I'm going to tell you, we're going to get a million emails of people like you're talking private jets. Sustainability, yeah. come on, you're, you're burning dead dinosaurs. Come on, here. I'm happy to do it. It's are one of you, my favorite topics. Are you following Elon's jet or, or Taylor's jet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know all about no, it. No, seriously. How do you think about? It? I mean, you guys hit a milestone recently but it's carbon offsets right no it's more than carbon offsets you want to do full emissions so this is the big mistake that people make in our industry and we're trying to actually lead the pack so we do 300 percent offsetting and it's built into the pricing it is no cost to the consumer this is a choice we made uh three and a half years ago and uh even during the time when we had to pay operators lots of money during the surge and really think about things we never wavered on this this is really important to us you do a full emissions offset it's not just doing carbon you know a carbon offset you're getting water vapors, aerosols, you know, every imprint that you possibly can, you're factoring that in. And we work with a partner who's gone through and certified a lot of different projects to help us with this, plus registering our offsets and everything else. So it's really important to us. We've probably offset about 1.3, 1.4 million metric tons of, of carbon dioxide at this point, And we're going to keep going. And we've got millions earmarked for it. We need to get to a world of sustainable aviation fuel. And we need to get this electric kind of world to happen. And it's going to happen further out than we hoped. 10 seconds. How quickly can we get there? Otherwise Seven years. Seven years? Yeah. It used to be five. Everybody would say five. I think mass consumer, mass passenger. You'll see some hybrids, but I think it's about five to seven years minimum. That was Sentient Jet President and CEO Andrew Collins, also the co-CEO of parent company FlexJet. And that's what's going on with the exclusive world of private flying. And Carol, speaking of the uh, luxury world, <laughs> yeah, I guess you could say, um, we're going to get another check on it, specifically South Florida real estate and how well it's doing. Yeah, case in point. Remember, we just uh, we recently talked about it was a Wall Street Journal story. It was about a hundred and twenty million dollar oceanfront penthouse in Miami Beach, said to be in contract for north of one hundred and twenty million. It's a sounds sum- expensive. <laughs> yeah, if you have to ask, what do we say? Yeah, you can't afford it. A sum that would make it the most expensive condominium ever sold in the Miami area. This, is according to people familiar with the deal, the previous record was half that price. This is again according to the Journal's reporting. Okay, the migration down south to Florida, it's its not anything new. We've reported on all the financial folks heading to Florida, Citadel's Ken Griffin and others, now calling South Florida home and pushing up demand and prices of commercial and residential real estate as a result. And so with all this in mind, we spoke with Dina golden Tayer, Executive Director of Sales over at Douglas Elliman. She joined us from Miami and says, well, the season, definitely busy. Our market, as they say, is caliente, and there is no sign of a slowdown uh, for the 10 million plus marketplace. This time last year, we in fact had a much slower high season, high season being defined as the months of December, January, February, March, April, when the snowbirds want to be here. And this year, we're having the type of high season that we had hoped for last year, which is pending sales almost every other day uh, for high quality assets that are appropriately priced. Who are the buyers right now and how are they buying? Are these all cash buyers? Where are they coming from? Uh, Give us insight there. They're the usual suspects. They are coming from New York, from other Northeastern states. They're coming from California and other Western uh, states, and they're coming from Canada. The European buyer has slowly trickled back into the marketplace post COVID, but they're not as strong as they were in prior years. What about buyers from Asia and buyers from Russia? No and no. And the buyers that I'm working with are not getting mortgages, or at least the deals are not finance contingent. Hmm. What's a typical deal uh, on the high end of Miami? You use $10 million as the price point. Is that kind of uh, the mean, uh, the median? Give us an idea, because I know that they can go a lot higher, especially if you do something like Indian Creek Village, which Bloomberg has written about uh, as being a place where millions don't matter. It's all about billions and billionaires. 
Um, 10 million gets you a nice condo. It gets you a nice house, a very nice house, not on the water, an average house on the water. 20 million is where it's at if you want something better than nice. And my 20 million plus product, I have the shortest days on market than any other sector that I represent. In fact, it takes me longer to sell properties five to 15 million than homes that are over 20 million, where I average about 120 to 150 days on market. Mm. Do you know who's selling right now? Who doesn't want to be there and who wants to sell for these prices? Sure. I mean, that is a broad question because people selling don't necessarily not want to be in Miami. They may be expanding their family or they may be going through a divorce. Uh, a lot of the people that for whom I sell for, they are staying locally just in a different asset class, like downsizing or upsizing or moving from a house to a condo or vice versa. You know, Tim was asking earlier, Dina, about uh, who's doing the buying. And we've talked, you know, uh, Bloomberg has done a lot of reporting about kind of Wall Street South and the amount of uh, financial folks that have moved down there, not only to live or buy a second home, but to actually set up shop and do work. And that has certainly yes. had an impact on, on the area. Give us a little bit more color, if you can, around what you are seeing on that front specifically. Is the pace continuing? Is it picking up? Is it slowing down at all? I think if we compare the pace to the COVID times, it will always feel like a slowdown. Now mm -hmm. Miami and Miami Beach, where I specifically focus on, has found a new rhythm. Uh, we continue to have an influx of the Wall Street types and other financiers from around the country. They are still taking prime positions uh, at the schools for their children and the top reservations in town because we have pretty much the same restaurants that New York City does, if not better right now. Um, so the pace is healthy. It's just not a COVID pace. And to compare it to that would always look like we're in the red. What about folks with backgrounds in crypto right now, especially given the rise in crypto that we've seen yeah, last year and in yeah. recent months? I'm glad you bring it up because crypto certainly has had a great couple of weeks. Um, but I have not seen the complete return of the crypto bros. And in fact, when I did work with that buyer class, they always paid cash. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, it's but <laughs> it's cash is cash. Yeah, got right. it. Yeah, no problem here. Um, easy close, quick close. But um, I have gotten a few calls lately asking if a seller would take crypto. So it is starting to come back as a but, subject point. Yeah, and I, I guess I was more interested in just the crypto bros part of it, but I'm surprised that uh, <laughs> you know you haven't seen the return of crypto bros completely that we saw a couple of years ago. No, and even, you know, they're already down here. They've already established residency. Um, so if they're going to be perhaps upgrading because their crypto is high, great. I'm excited to work with them again. But they're not the conversation uh, at the height of the topics that are being discussed around town. That was Dina Goldenthayer, Executive Director of Sales at Douglas Elliman. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Suite. Coming up, we talk wine, we sample wine with the editor-in-chief of Wine & Spirits magazine. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. Listen on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. At the beginning of each year, Wine & Spirits polls what it considers the best restaurants all over the U.S. to get a better understanding of where the wine industry is and where it's going, things such as the most popular wines at that given time and more. The results of the poll, they're not out yet, but we did get a little sneak peek with Wine & Spirits magazine editor-in-chief Josh Green. He joined us in the Bloomberg studio where he started out by giving an overview of challenges facing the wine industry. Things are a bit of a struggle in the wine industry right now. In fact, I think that the supply issues never really balanced out. And that, in addition to a lot of changing demographic trends, mm. have really hit the industry pretty hard this past year. Um, we saw it in our poll, and we also saw it in some data that was just released by SipSource, um, which is part of WSWA, the Wine and Spirits Wholesaler Association. Um, where they look at wholesaler depletions. And in year over year, 22 to 23, volume was down by 8.1%. And um, Nielsen, Nielsen, I think- the inventory had, was taken down because of a lot of, how many understand? It's really, people don't really know exactly, yeah. I, I don't think people know exactly what's going on. I think okay. that people say that young people are drinking less, whether young people want to be drinking less or just simply can't afford to be drinking at the prices that wine costs now. Is another question, I've had and that's a lot something of good that twenty dollar bottle, twenty dollar bottle of wine. They're I mean, great twenty dollar bottles of wine. Right? They're great. They're great twelve dollar bottles of wine. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I think there's no. We've talked about this a lot, but, but there's yeah. no question that 
the younger demographic is not drinking at the same rate that previous mm -hmm. demographics were. Um, athletic Brewing, you know, the non-alcoholic beer. love. Which big I love. fan. They are the top-selling beer at Whole Foods right now, huh. including mm -hmm. all the alcohol-inclusive beers, too. So I think that speaks to sort of a changing shift mm -hmm. in how consumers are thinking about it. But it's interesting to hear that about wine, too. Well, and in our poll, what, what we did this year was quite different from how we've done it in the past because I think polling has really radically changed across the board. Um, I mean, I just heard something on, on the news this morning about how respondents used to be like 70% of polls and now it's 1% if you're lucky. Oh. So, so you think so, there might be some issues with the data? Not with, no, what I'm saying is that we did it completely differently this year. So what we did was we called, we, we literally called and interviewed 100 people and we selected who we were gonna call and we had 12 people on the team doing it and we asked them all the same questions right, right down the line. Um, and so we gathered the information differently than we have in the past, which was having people fill out a, a form in the past. And so it's, it's less data than we've had in the past, but it's a very different, we're asking very different questions. Is it more nuanced and or more, do you feel like more specific in terms of the way you guys did it? It's more, it's more nuanced, nuanced yeah. and it's also that we were able to f do a lot of follow-up questions with people on the spot, you know, when people would tell us that they, were, that they were moving in this direction or that direction, that we could really then pin them down to why and what, was, what that was about. And it really, what, what was fascinating to us is that it, it filled, it, it mirrored exactly what you're talking about, Tim, with, I mean, we heard so much about non-alcoholic wine and non-alcoholic cocktails which we've never heard about before in our polls, ever. Kind of wild, right? Yeah. A lot of people who are doing tasting menus with pairings would traditionally do, like they've now turned to doing a tasting menu and a vegan tasting menu or, or, or a um, or vegetarian tasting menu. Plus, they've turned to doing alcoholic pairings and non-alcoholic pairings. And I'm just trying to find, the, I think it was um, Stephen Schaefer at Mago in, in, um, in Oakland. He said that they sold the same number of non-alcoholic pairings as alcoholic pairings wow. for them. Yeah. That's, That's so surprising. That was a quick shift. Completely, yeah. He's, so what does it mean for the wine industry? It means there's going to be a lot of soul searching and there's going to be a lot of change. And what, to me, what's interesting about the results of the poll this year is that we spoke with the really creative leaders of, you know, the people who are trying to find ways to connect with their guests right. about what they want to be drinking. And so we heard a lot about what these creative wine directors are doing to deal with this trend of people drinking less. And the volume is down. I haven't seen numbers about the value. Mm. So the industry may not be hurt as badly on value as on volume. Meaning raising prices in order to compensate uh, for uh, lost volume? Meaning that the wines that are selling, not necessarily raising prices, but the at wines the that are point. selling are at a higher point price point than, you know, there, there was a lot of wine being sold in this market at, you know, there was two buck chuck. Right. Um, <laughs> Never, and now, ever, ever. Now, it, now people are looking at $12 <laughs> no. wine rather than two buck chuck. But so. it's funny, I, my husband who loves- Now there's Josh wine. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> new but two, my husband two who loves wine, like, I think would much rather have a bottle of really expensive or a nice, really nice bottle of wine, mm -hmm. maybe less frequently versus maybe not as a expensive and maybe not as good. I hate, yeah. to, I hate to do price and quality because I do think you can find some great um, inexpensive wines, but you know what I'm saying? Like make it an experience and be something. I think people find a lot of value in that, in that experience. And I think that the industry is moving in that direction to provide experiences. Yeah. A lot of That's yeah, a lot consider. of younger people appreciate buying into an experience rather than just buying alcohol. So there, yeah. a lot of a lot of what's going on in, in the transitions in the industry are developing these kind of experiences for people. And Josh, we want to talk a little bit more about kind of some of the trends that you're seeing. As we do this, we are going to have Stephen uh, Schmitz is here with us, who came along with you, and he's going to open up a bottle of wine for us so that we can sample a little bit. I think the first wine is a white wine. A white wine. From the Azores. Yep. From the Azores. Okay. Um, <laughs> nice pronunciation. <laughs> How do you say it so that we all know? Well, in, in the United States, we say Azores. Okay. But in Portugal, they would say Azores. Steve's gonna, all right, oh, Steven got the pop. That was not trouble. All he right. knows how to do is it. Is that one of the trends that we're seeing in terms of wines that people are either asking for or restaurants are playing with? What do you see? So what 
the main trend that we saw in the poll was that um, a lot of the leaders in the in the wine director industry, you know, the, the sommelier industry, they are looking for alternatives to the big name wines and the and the high priced wines, and they're looking for legitimate alternatives to them because these are very the the a lot of the restaurants we poll are very high level restaurants with a lot of they're they're not inexpensive, but one of the things we asked was. Um, what new category or region did you add this year that got the most traction on your list? And the m more people, so 13 out of 100 people said Portugal. That was the most of any region that people responded Why to. Why is that? Well, many people said that it's because people are traveling there. And everybody's like going everybody's to Portugal. So my parents are going to Portugal yeah. in a few weeks. Everybody's going to Portugal. So it used to be that people would go to Tuscany, come back and want to drink Chianti. Yeah. And now people are going to Portugal and coming back and wanting to drink Portuguese wine. And so this this is a Portuguese wine that we brought, and this is like Tell us this, about this, this yeah. is killer wine. Um, so, smells smells really. So we brought I a huge we actually brought wine, two wines from our top 100 event that we just did two oh, weeks ago. In, awesome, in, um, Nazdrovia, yeah. as we say. Um, <laughs> so this is from the Azores, and it's from Arinto de Azores, which is a, a white grape, and the vines are more than 100 years old. That's nice. So it is um, very concentrated. Yeah. Um, it's also in a place that's very windy, so that deepens the concentration of the wine even more because the, the wind is drying out the, the grapes a bit. Yeah. Um, and it also has a lot of salinity because you get all of the ocean spraying salt into the land yeah. there. Yeah. It's so really, It's really good. It's lovely. I really like this, it. I love this wine. I'm completely... And I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of white wines. Mm -hmm. This is lovely. Lovely. What's, what's, the, what's the varietal of this wine? So it, the varietal is Orinto, okay. but it's Orinto of the Azores. Okay. So this would be obviously Ooh, much like crisper and, and finer if it's colder, but we like to show the wines at sort of cool room temperature so you can actually really taste them. And I think the length in this wine is extraordinary. Are we also then seeing, uh, I'm assuming as people are traveling and bringing, you know, what they find overseas or in Portugal, that restaurants are responding in terms of expanding what's on the wine list a little bit in terms yes. of the offerings? Yes. So um, what was... Fascinating to me. Stephen, you can go ahead and I know he's got another. We're going to move from white to red in a moment. So Stephen's going to open up. Are you done with bottle. your white? <laughs> no. Okay. We've done. We've pulled these juggle. restaurants for 35 yeah. years. Yeah. We've never heard a peep about Portugal. Not like barely a mention in any description of wines that they were selling. And this year, Haksu Kim at Per Se was talking about hmm. it. Interesting. Aldo Sam at Le Bernardin was talking about it. Across the country, people were talking about it. Yeah. It was really surprising. That's recognition. I mean, these yeah. are you're talking about your top restaurants. Well, Aldo, Aldo was saying that he has a wine called Koch from a producer called Niport in the Douro. And there's a wine that is made in a similar style to a white burgundy, but it's obviously very different grapes and it's a very different climate. But it's, it gives you the same, it sort of scratches the same itch as a white burgundy would. And he poured it for a couple collectors who had come in that don't know about Portugal wine at all. They loved it. They wanted to buy a case of it when they left. Yeah. Um, they were completely enthralled with it. Carol just poured the red. The red. Yes. I just poured the red. We're going to pass it around. In terms of pricing, I mean, like I said to you, I have expanded my mind a bunch over mm -hmm. the last few years. But not all the way to two buck chuck. No, not to two buck chuck. But um, in terms of talking to folks like you and others and really kind of learning in that, I like to try things. And it's amazing the amount of um, variety that you can get in terms of the cost of wines and just because it's less expensive doesn't mean mm -hmm. it's a bad wine. No. These two wines are not less expensive because okay. they, they are from <laughs> they are two of the best wines we tasted last year. Don't spill in other so, words, kids. Yeah. So they do make a less expensive wine of uh, from Orinto and also from Verdeo that's beautiful as well, but it's not as concentrated and rich and it's lighter and fresher. Right. Um but it's from much younger vines, not 100-year-old vines. And that's the real difference usually, typically, or what? Um, what you get with an older vine, I mean, it, it's interesting. And I, I brought the magazine with me for, for you guys to, to look at after. Um, and I have an article in here about old vines in Austria. Mm -hmm. I talked a lot with people over there about what nice. they're getting from old vine fruit that's different from younger vine fruit yeah. and how they're sustaining their old vines to do that. And you get the concentration that you wouldn't otherwise get. You get a different maturation process during the growing season. Right. So 
what Kathy Corson, we're, we're drinking Kathy Corson's Cabernet now. What she's done is she's sustained very old vines in Napa Valley. She has probably the oldest Cabernet vines in one block in Napa Valley, 72, I think they were planted. And this is from her own other grapes and from some purchased grapes, but all in that same area. That was Wine and Spirits Magazine Editor-in-Chief Josh Green. All right, Mr. Stenovic, speaking of fine wine and dining, how how about a sandwich to go with a nice bottle of wine? You can pair anything with a (laughs) bottle of wine, Carol. I don't care what people say. I thought you were going to say you could pair anything with a good sandwich. You can't pair anything with a good sandwich. That's not what I'm worried about. I'm worried about people being like, okay, you know, you can't have this wine with this sandwich. Just eat the sandwich. Okay, well, we've got the most sumptuous choices in London, along with the rodeo that's changing lives for young black wranglers. Bloomberg Pursuits is straight ahead on Bloomberg Business Week. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Listen live each weekday starting at 2 p.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. All right, Tim, skiing in Scandinavia? I would love to. (laughs) Surprise, surprise. How about a wild ride courtesy of the Bill Pickett Invitational Rodeo? I can ride horses. I could do this. (laughs) Okay, check, check. Uh, And one thing I know is a slam dunk for you, for sure, sandwiches. Uh, Say no more, Carol. The key to my heart. (laughs) He eats one in the 4 o'clock hour of our show every day. A sandwich a day keeps the doctor away. (laughs) Wait, live on the radio? (laughs) Yes, I do. Well, during a break. During commercial break. Sometimes he's got to chew quick before we get on air. No one wants to hear that. All of this recently being covered by our Bloomberg Pursuits team, led by the editor of Pursuits, Chris Rouser. And Chris, let's start with the pursuit story on the best sandwiches found in and around London, courtesy of the top chefs there, and brought to us by none other than the food editor of Pursuits, Kate Crater, who also joins us from London. Kate, hello, hello. Hi, hi. <laughs> sandwiches. Right. Sam- Damn, I hope you're eating a sandwich right now. <laughs> you know, it depends on what your definition of a sandwich <laughs> is, Kate, because there's a lot of debate about this. <laughs> Um, Well, you're speaking from the right place to have that debate because in New York State, um, the Department of Taxation believes that really you could have a buttered roll, like anything, any piece of any kind of bread that has some at least some butter on it is a sandwich. And Bloomberg Pursuits says no to that, by the way. Going against the regulators, Kate. (laughs) When I was a kid, I thought that was a sandwich. Chris, come on in on this. Kate does such great stuff. Um, Love this. What did you want to know about sandwiches? So we do this series periodically where Kate talks to top chefs in different locations, uh, different cities, and she asks them what their favorite restaurants are, what their favorite pastries are. Um, And she pitched doing the best sandwiches in London a while ago. Uh, And it has been a long germinating story because there's a lot of sandwiches on this list. Agreed. And it actually, we have to send people to take pictures of them. And it it kept taking a long time. And I kept being like, Kate, this is a high priority. (laughs) We need to know the best sandwiches in London. and I'm just thrilled it came out because they look extremely delicious. I'm just going to tell you guys that I read this uh, going home and it was like after eight, I was starving and I'm like, oh, my God, I just want them all. All right. So, Kate, tell us where we should start here. Well, the thing that's cool and why you guys should come to London and broadcast the show from here is that <laughs> London really is sandwich central. And, you know, people talk about a sad dusk lunch all the time, but the sandwiches here at places like pret manger and even sort of supermarket chains like Marks and Spencer are really good. And they are, I have to say, better than like the average sandwich you would get in New York. And in fact, top chefs agree. And we have um, we have a chef called Samir Tunisia who picked a Tesco sandwich. Tesco is like a really like really supermarket chain. Like it's sort of like as all purpose as you can get. He picked a coronation chicken sandwich and it costs less than three pounds, which is less than four bucks as his favorite sandwich, which I think is kind of fantastic. Kate, you know? I wish you could see Tim's face as you were talking about <laughs> Tesco really? and Pride sandwiches. <laughs> you, you stand by this, right? You think these sandwiches, these like big um, chain sandwiches are legit? It's super legit, like super legit. Although I will say I'm not, I am not going to Tesco to buy my sandwiches. But Mark <laughs> it's only three pounds. <laughs> I know. But I mean, I could afford to do it. Is, but is a pret sandwich in the UK different than a pret sandwich I get in New York City? 
Yes, I'm going to say yes, it is, and it's better. The bread, like they just, I think they care more about it, and the quality of the bread is better. There is more filling. The ingredients feel like they're better sourced. So if you have a tuna mayo sandwich here, I will put it side to side against the one that you get in New York, and you will know, you will agree that it's better. Can I just go back to coronation ki- mm. chicken? I didn't even know that there was a thing. This goes back oh to Queen God. Elizabeth, do, right? Oh, yeah. Do your Queen Elizabeth the second. Um, <laughs> if you do some research on that, you'll know it was served to her like at her coronation. It's a sort of creamy chicken curry um, that has become a favorite sandwich on afternoon teas and then also at Tesco. And believe it or not, a couple people here, because it's also in everyone's budget, went, went and did a taste test um, since the story came out. I know three people here. Who have gone to get it and um, confirm that it's a good sandwich? Tim, you would uh, so I'm, eat it. You oh, would I would eat so any eat it. I would eat anything on here. But I, I will say, Kate, I'm a little surprised to see some of the picks on here. I mean, a, a, a poor boy, which is you know traditionally a U.S. like New Orleans mm-hmm. type of thing, and then something from Five Guys. Like, I agree. I was kind of like, what? Kate, Kate, you guys, what's I am going on all here? over. I am all <laughs> over that Five Guys recommendation because if you read about it, if you think about it, what they do is they use an inside out bun. So they take a bun and they grill. It, they griddle it inside out, and it's slathered with mayonnaise before it's griddled, and then they like melt cheese all over. It's melted American cheese, and then you can put all the toppings on it. So I know when I first saw when I first saw that pick, I was a little. I thought that was sketchy. Doctors love it. <laughs> exactly. Ozempic, please. But Kate, exactly. you know the the things that were really I thought most fun for me on this list were places uh, with really funny British names like the Dusty Knuckle. Uh, that <laughs> which is an awesome. Real... Which has also shown up on these on these roundups that we've done. It's also one of London's premier bakeries, so <clears throat> it will be the first stop when you guys are here. I, my my favorite was the honey truffle and parmesan pork ciabatta from the Black Pig. I had it when I was there. No way. My Girl. daughter and I shared it, sat on a curb, went over to Borough Market. How was it? So proud. Unfreaking believable. It was yay. So good. So good. And the line, and they have such a system, right, Kate? Down, like they just, you're in it, like you're just, they just like manufacture it really quickly, and it's yours, like it's just great. There is always a line, but the line does move quickly, and so, um, so yeah. Oh my God, Carol, fantastic. Um, another thing that's fun on this list I like a lot is this Jamaican patty and cocoa bread, which comes from this great chef, Dom Taylor, who has a very hot restaurant in the Langham Hotel. It's called the Good Front Room. And so usually people will eat one of these Jamaican um, patties, which is stuff with ground meat or chicken just by itself. But Dom Taylor, who comes from Jamaica, knows that like the key move is to put it in cocoa bread. Mm. And so and they do it at this place. And cocoa bread is a little bit it's got its name because it's flavored with coconut milk. So it's like puffy and pillowy and a little bit sweet. And then you bite into I actually went to get one and it's so good. I'm making Tim's Tesco face at that. <laughs> I don't know. Come on, surf and turf, buddy. Yeah. All right. It's surf and turf, precisely. Precisely. Well, we're going to all go run up to the food court after this and be like, where are the sandwiches? <laughs> Kate's going to bring us some. Mm-hmm. When you come in April. We love you. We love you. This is such a great big, read. Big all right. Kate Kreider, be well. Food editor of Pursuits. Thank you. you bet. Joining us from London. All right. I am certainly, certainly hungry, but I also know that there's one story we really wanted to talk to. Tim and I have read it. Tell us about this pill. Bill Pickett Invitational Rodeo that's been around for a while. Yes, it is the only, it was founded in 1984, the world's only touring black rodeo. Uh, And it was founded by an event promoter, this guy Lou Vasson, who had gone to a couple of rodeos and saw basically that there were no black people in either the audience or on the horses. And so he was like, I'm going to change that. And he founded this and he passed away recently and his uh, wife, um, Valeria Howard Cunningham is now the president and it's really taking off. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been sold out for the past two years. It's in uh, 20 rodeos annually across seven states and it's just this amazing, wild, fun rodeo for family, kids all ages, right. as kids as young as six can ride and compete and win prizes and it's just like a real cultural moment. What I find so interesting about this, Chris, is that as you and the team write in the piece, black cowboys uh, were very prominent in the 19th century. Up to 25% of 19th century cowboys were black, yet 
here we are in this in this world where they've essentially been ignored uh, by pop culture and and by the They're media. They're not so part of the story. Yeah. People don't understand that part of the story. Yeah, it's been. I mean, it's basically been written out of Hollywood films. It's been written out of uh, popular literature. And um, some people, uh, including Pharrell, are actually trying to bring this back to the forefront. So Pharrell is now uh, the creative director at Louis Vuitton, and he went to uh, the Bill Pickett Invitational, and he saw one of the writers, and he. Uh, got him to come to Paris and walk in his first show, his Love first that. runway show for Louis Vuitton, Kamal Miller, um, who, and this kid was like, wait, what? You want me to do what? <laughs> uh, and Pharrell showed him how to walk. And um, yeah, it was just this crazy thing. And I like how they're kind of helping out a younger black generation too in, mm-hmm. in this. Um, love the story. And I agree with you. I feel like as we continue to realize the American history that we've known and loved, have realized how wrong a lot of it was. Mm-hmm. And so I thought that that fact, if you will, was pretty significant. Um, this is our gift to Tim. We've got to do a little bit about skiing in Scandinavia. Yeah. Hey, Tim, have you been skiing in Scandinavia? I haven't been skiing in Scandinavia, but my understanding, I haven't even actually been skiing in Europe at all. Okay. Um, and my understanding, it's, I've been talking about this a lot actually with friends, uh, skiing in Europe is actually on a whole a lot cheaper than skiing in the United States. Yeah. One challenge that they're dealing with though, that we're also dealing with is climate change and shorter ski seasons and a lack of snow. And it turns out people are going to Scandinavia because well, the snow exists there. Yeah, so right now more than a quarter of uh, ski resorts in the Alps are closed because the season's over. I can't believe that. Yeah, Austria had its shortest season ever. That's crazy. Um, you remember last year there was like green, there were green slopes yeah. until January in, in Europe. Um, and so more people are looking to go to Scandinavia and because they're guaranteed longer winters, more snow. The terrain is not um, as like craggy and that surprised me. As the Alps, that surprised me too. Yeah, you think like, you know, you're like near the North Pole, it's like super rugged, but it's not really the case. Yeah, the resorts actually tend to be more in like central. Like the North Pole? Did I get that right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's at the top of the world. <laughs> it also helps if you've got an airport nearby or you actually have um, a 747 to get you there. You hold a minority stake in that airport to get people there. <laughs> yeah, so we, we spoke to um, um, the owner of Stoughton, which is a resort about six hours from Stockholm, their past sales are up 22% wow, this year. That's a lot. And that is in part because they recently opened an airport, which uh, has connecting flights from a lot of European cities. So it's a lot easier to get there. And people are just considering it in a way that they hadn't before. I meant Arctic Circle when I said North Pole. <laughs> we okay. lost him. Yeah. Come back. Come back. <laughs> I'm back. I'm Should here. we talk yeah. sandwiches again? <laughs> Keep your attention here. No, but it's really like amazing. I feel like you guys have been covering this, just the changing because of climate change. Like mm-hmm. It creates problems for some areas of the world and opportunities for others, Chris. Yeah, and there's a new resort opening for the 2025-2026 slash ski season, which you know they spent $2 billion kroner on, and it's part of a bigger network. Like People are really investing in this area as people in the Alps and other parts of Europe are kind of struggling to figure out what to do. All right. The, the reason I said Arctic Circle is because some of these ski areas, <laughs> some of these ski areas do sit north of the Arctic Circle. That's pretty cool. This is when you're yeah. like, <laughs> yes, that's true. Yeah, and those ones are more mountainous. The the ones that are further north with tougher terrain. All right, we got to wrap, guys. Uh, that's going to do it <laughs> for this edition of Pursuits. And that, of course, is the editor of Pursuits, Chris Rouse. Or also a big thank you to food editor of Pursuits, Kate Crater, also joining us there. On the best sandwiches from London, Carol. It really was a good sandwich. I wanted to go back. My daughter's like, "No, we're going to go." Somewhere Did you really else. split one though? Yeah, we, it was. I would have gotten another one. You would have liked it. Yeah. You would have liked it. Well, be sure to tune into Bloomberg <laughs> Business Week Monday through Friday, starting at two p.m. Wall Street time on Bloomberg TV, Bloomberg Radio, and on Sirius XM Channel One Twenty One. You can also watch our daily broadcast on YouTube. Just search Bloomberg Global News. We're simulcast on Bloomberg Originals, available at Bloomberg.com/originals and streaming platforms like Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Samsung TV Plus, and more. Find our Bloomberg Business Week podcast at Bloomberg.com, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. The latest edition of the magazine also available on newsstands now at bloomberg.com and always on the bloomberg terminal i'm tim stenevec and i'm carol masser have a good and safe weekend stay with us today's top stories and global business headlines coming up right now this is the bloomberg business week podcast available on apple spotify and anywhere else you get your podcasts listen live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m eastern on bloomberg.com the iHeartRadio app Tune in and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.
You're listening to the Podcast Spotlight Hour on Bloomberg Radio. 